We take our natural resources around the world for granted, depleting our rainforests, overfishing our oceans, polluting our rivers, and even the air we breathe. These resources are all vital to our survival, and organizations like Rewild and the Green Protector are working incredibly hard to conserve and regenerate them. Secretary O'Mara, first of all, welcome back. The Secretary was last on our stage in 2021, where he pledged and delivered to protect what ended up being the only additional area of the Amazon rainforest that was protected over the last four years. That was a promise delivered. Thank you, Secretary O'Mara. Can we get a round of applause? <laughs> Honorable Secretary, you know, I have to ask, the Lula and Dilma administrations have made a point about protecting the Amazon rainforest. That's easier said than done. How do we hold the Lula administration accountable to that promise? Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the invitation for the Global Citizen. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think we live in new moments. Uh, and after four years of regressions that the forestation increase in Brazil, we have a uh, uh, challenge, but an uh, uh, opportunity to in, that have to include people, economy, and living forests. Uh, we have to include these three axes because we have almost three, 30 million people in the legal Amazon, 90 million in Pará, that was uh, in poverty in, in the most of, of, of this place. And they have to change the the way they, they, lie, they live to a new economy. And in Pará, in the last four years, we implemented policies, plans, and actions to change this. Now, our, our, our goal is to decrease the emissions until 2036 and, and restorations, 5.6 million of the forests. So we have to uh, state plan of bioeconomy that uh, uh, includes this, the seeds, the, the, the leaves, and the, all the solutions based in the nature and the forests. Uh, we have to safeguard our indigenous peoples, our traditional communities, and, and, our, and our people. It, it, take care of people. So, I think that the governor Lula now can be the, the leader of the, the coordinate all these actions to combat the deforestations and change the access of the economy on, on Brazil, at Brazil. So we know, unfortunately, because we've already destroyed so much of the Amazon rainforest, there is already loss and damage that's been sustained that we can't recover. Anisa, first of all, congratulations again on last night. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> Anisa, you co-founded the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition. Why is this issue, and in particular loss and damage finance, so important in the fight to protect nature? Um, thank you so much. Um, so for me, when uh, I'm talking about loss and damage, is that point that is causing me uh, anxiety because I'm not able to see a future if you're not able to address it right now. And for, for the fact that it has been in existence since 1992, but then not having concrete climate action towards this since that time, is the one that is cause, it caused me to realize that um, I am part of the generation that do understand all the broken promises that world leaders gave us since the start of, uh, of, the, of the era. Uh, but then I'm also part of that generation that is also be able to implement concrete solution. And what really, what really we need to put forward as the today generation is to um, risk and put ourselves out there with the concrete solution that we are having. So for us, uh, loss and damage uh, finance, especially, is that opportunity to allow um, developing countries, frontline voices, especially women and the youth, uh, to be really respected in decision-making process and listen to their concern. Because if you hear from the 
different message that we're receiving here about access to climate finance. We are demanding the loss and damage finance to be new, additional, and accessible. The newality is important for us because we know the past commitment has never been fulfilled and we don't want this, uh, the finance loss and damage to be an additional burden that is going to, uh, to create another competition, competition between uh, different agendas that we are having. But the accessibility is the one that is really important because we know the different solution that is existing for our planet is not able to be accessible for the grassroots actors or the community or developing countries because the access modality is not really adequate to the need of the frontline uh, community. But what we are aiming to do in the coalition is also to offer a little bit of uh, an idea of how this one is looking like. Because we have, a, we have worked with different partners, for example, to fund 11 youth-driven action to address loss and damage in different parts of the world. And the message that we are co is coming around is that it's really possible to narrow down uh, extreme massive forces of young people to take action on climate. And yes, it's to, to all link with the planet, because of our planet, we are the one who destroy it. By we, I mean humans in general, but then we are the current generation that is going to be left around with the huge burden, but we are choosing to be part of the solution, and that is uh, one thing that should be respected in, the, in, this, uh, in this kind of, uh, in this year, because if we are respected as active stakeholders, we are able to design concrete solution on the national and international level. So, yeah, let's give Anisa a round of applause. That was fantastic. Uh, so, Dr. Tariq, you're a world-respected leader in education. You work with youth around the world. But why is education so important in the fight against climate change? What are you here today calling for, and how can we all help? Um, thank you, Michael. <clears throat> Look, to us, Michael, the, uh, the education issue and the climate issue is, is, is exactly one. We can't transform our education systems and, and, and work through um, 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 up-to-date systems, innovate new systems without putting the climate issues into consideration and vice versa. We cannot uh, 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 have solutions to climate without having climate, not as an education, but as, uh, as, as, as a subject built into our curriculum. So, so if you look at the, both issues integrated into one, and you see what's happening in the world in terms of working in silos, that's the biggest issue. To solve the Amazon problem, you cannot get any, um, a, a, any person outside that uh, uh, demographic to come and solve it. You need to get the indigenous groups from there. You need to get the locals, the communities, who understand the issues and how to solve them or how to have a prevention um, 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 take uh, to it. So, my point is, if we can gather all the sectors together, listen from society, listen from, from all the governments, uh, and have a cross-sectoral approach, and have it through a whole-of-society ecosystem uh, approach as well, that's where you will uh, start getting all the strategies and goals aligned towards the cause that you want. And with Dubai Cares, what we have done is we broke the silos two years ago at the Rewired Summit, the one we launched in Dubai at Expo 2020. But now we're renewing that summit. We're going to have the second edition at the COP28. Dubai Cares, we signed two months ago with the COP28 presidency to be the exclusive education partner. So, and everything got to do with climate and education, green skills and green jobs towards greener economies. That's what we're going to talk at the Rewired Summit. And the main, uh, um, main goal of the Rewired Summit is to come out with action uh, points to the UNFCCC and, 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 and all the future COPs to have education embedded as a full day thematic as it is for the first time this year, but also come out with an outcome report with a policy paper to tell all um, uh, decision makers and policy makers the co-relationship between education and climate. So thank you, Dr. Tariq. And I think on that point, you mentioned COP28. And I know we've got our work cut out over the next seven months. And to that end, Rodrigo, you joined us in 2021, campaigning with Rewild, Coldplay, to deliver on Honorable Secretary's commitment, which was delivered upon. But you've got some exciting news for us today. This is, after all, from Ideas to Impact. What would you like to share? Uh, yeah, thank you, Miki, uh, for having us, the Brazilians, here on this, on this panel. And as you mentioned, I mean, the destruction of the rainforest, the Amazon rainforest, it is a tragedy, and a tragedy that affects uh, us all. 
uh, indistinctly. And I was uh, speaking this morning with people from the food panel that what he said, it is to see that only one industry is driving 90% of that destruction, which means, I mean, uh, cattle and cattle feed industry is, is responsible behind all of that. But it's a tragedy that we can come to solution, and all it comes with one word, it is partnership. And then we start this beautiful campaign 2021, and along with you guys and Coldplay, we mobilize a lot of voices in Brazil for the forests. And of course, I cannot, uh, 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 I have to acknowledge one of those voices that help us to do this, not only the governor, Elder Barbalho, and Mauro, the secretariat, but uh, we have this amazing woman, Angela. Where is Angela? From a local organization that fight a lot. Please, Angela, stand up. Uh, that really is a local voice, I mean, working for the protected areas in Brazil. We have this amazing indigenous leader, uh, Pui Tembe. Pui was just there, but I think she had to go to the restroom. She's, she will be back very, very soon. And it's good to see this, this amazing uh, local people, but also comes up for, lo for, for global partners. And I have my great friend, he, Christian Samper, that is leading this amazing, Christian, please, this amazing coalition of organizations around the globe that bringing catalytic money to Brazil to help to solve all this problem. We have this new leadership coming to Brazil with Lula, with Barbalho. And uh, as a result of that, it is really, really my pleasure to announce today that we are expanding from that campaign, that small campaign that started two years ago, we are expanding investments uh, in Pará, uh, $5 million out of $20 million that we are seeking to expand conservation and new protected areas in the Southern Corridor uh, in Amazon. And this will lead us to create a new protected areas uh, on that region, securing territories for indigenous people in local communities, and of course, in bringing benefits to all of us in this room, all of us in this planet, by the way. Thanks, Rodrigo. That's amazing. Thank you. And I know we've got so much more to do. That's, that's a great first start, but it is a down payment. Okay, last round of questions. We're going to try and do this rapid fire because we've got a lot to get through. But first, Honorable Secretary, what will this funded mean for you and your state? So this, uh, the importance is, is the platforms uh, in, in initiatives like uh, Global Citizens is so much important to articulate the so civil society companies, celebrities, to focus on the climate change and, uh, and support uh, new, uh, new areas, uh, protected areas, and new forms to conserve the, the forests. So for us in Pará, that you, we want to leadership this this process, uh, the, the support of global citizens and the, is, is so much important for us. And all this represents that we are in the, in the, the right path to achieve our goal. And so I thank you for global citizens and all these celebrities and companies involved in, in this initiative because it is very important to us. So thank our you. actions do make a difference. It's great. Um, Anisa and Dr. Tariq, I'm going to give you the last joint question together. Um, and so, really, we know when we've heard a lot, young people, women and girls, they are both, the, all of these groups are both marginalized and impacted the most by climate change. We're seeing new rounds of climate refugees. You know, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of devastation, particularly amongst these groups. But for young people and women and girls, you know, what are some concrete actions that we can all take you know, who can we call on, governments to private sectors, foundations, to help these marginalized groups? Um, thank you so much. I feel for me, um, it would be first to recognize that those who are at the front line experiencing these damages are also holding solution because we've been experiencing this uh, impact for quite some time. And for example, I come from a country, Rwanda, where we have um, like real models of how a um, community can take ac concrete action, climate action. But the only issue is that uh, we are having partners who are not really ready to take risk on uh, working with the youth Related organization on the on the grass on the grass level, but this also can be translated on the international level. Uh, the other thing that we really we need to also put forward is to ensure that youth are given the power in the decision making process, not only to be on the spotlight when the, when the mic is on you and the camera, but also be having the power to decide what are the projects in your community, 
are they good for you? Are, go are they going to respond? Are, are, are going to, they to respond to the to your current crisis? But most importantly, are, are they going to be able to help you be much more confident of a, if a sustainable future? Because currently, it's not. Even if it's there, it's, a, it's on a scale that is really um, very minimal. Uh, we need much more uh, actions on the way. Dr. Tariq? Um, with us, um, if we really want to in include them and solve the issue, we need to increase the investment in, in, in uh, 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 climate adaptation and uh, resilience approaches. So once that is done for the young people and for women, you can include them into society. The second is exactly where, where what you mentioned uh, uh, a bit earlier, is, is, is actually put them into the decision-making tables locally, regionally, internationally, and let them be involved into the negotiations as well. And as I mentioned earlier, there, are, the, 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 there there's some demographic that has been ignored and not uh, led to, to be sitting on a table to negotiate and put these decisions as well. Uh, we need to, to also um, skill um, uh, the women and young children with the climate education, but also with green skills as well. Not green skills to to solve the issues of today, but even prep them for the new jobs of tomorrow. And, 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 and lastly, there has to be a proper collaboration vertically and horizontally, uh, cross-sectoral, as well as the whole system. Well, I want to thank our distinguished panel. From the Amazon to loss and damage, we've all heard about it, but at the end of the day, all of these are global public goods, which is what the Power Our Planet campaign will benefit. That's the next step in the journey for us. We've got to start somewhere with keeping our promises. Thank you, Secretary, for your example. That's what we need to do. Thank you, everyone. Please give our distinguished panel a wonderful round of applause. Thank you.